Good morning. As you know, we have suspended temporarily the in-person worship at Lovely Lane Chapel due to the COVID surge here in Glen County, but I'm glad to be with you this morning to share this message with you. I will continue to evaluate uh, the uh, situation weekly and hopefully we will be back in person soon. Uh, we miss seeing you, but uh, we're glad that we can uh, stay together and worship together in this way virtually. Psalm 103. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagle. Let all that I am praise the Lord. Let us this morning praise the Lord as we worship him. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we do praise you for all good things come from you. You give us healing and salvation you give us relationship with yourself and with others. May we be bound by your love. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. Bind us together in love. And so as we celebrate this day and praise you, we thank you for this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for this time to focus our hearts and our minds on you. Lord, let us give ourselves wholly and all to you. Lord, we come with burdens and joys on our hearts and minds, and you are here to eat, meet each one of us. And so now in the silence of our hearts, we lift these up to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, we come to you as children of God because you have adopted us into your royal and holy family. And so it is with confidence of children of God that we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us Affirm our faith with the historic confession, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're starting a new series today. It's called Doers of the Word, and it seems to be a natural sequel to the Faith in Action series we just completed. And this Doer of the Word series is going to be based on the book of James. James is a unique uh, New Testament epistle. It's a book of admoni admonitions. Proverbial sayings are intermingled with prescriptions of conduct. And it strongly reminds you of the book of Proverbs. It really represents wisdom literature in New Testament form. Now, 
who authored James is up to some debate, but it's been ascribed to either James, the son of Zebedee, James, the brother of Jesus, or an unknown writer who wrote in the name of James of Jerusalem. Many assume that the author was James, the brother of Jesus. If so, it was probably written before 62 AD because that was a year that Jesus' brother was martyred. And as a brother of Jesus, James experienced exposure to him to a far greater degree than any person outside the home of Mary and Joseph. So we can reasonably assume that Jesus shared his understanding of scripture with other members of his family in the years prior to his public ministry. As Jesus ordered his life in keeping with his sense of God as Father, I'm sure he probably explained to them the guiding principles of his life. And he, these insights were brought to maturity as he embarked on his teaching ministry. But in reality, Jesus' family, James included, were his first listeners for more than a decade. Our text today comes from James chapter 1, verses 17 through 27. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, and we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God has planted in your heart, for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully, into the perfect law that sets you free. And if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Will you pray with me? Oh Lord, speak to us now that we may hear you and you alone. Let it not be me speaking, for nothing I can offer will be of importance. But word coming from you will bring life and meaning. In Jesus' name, amen. What we're really asking in this series is you say you've been saved or claimed by Christ. So what? How will your life be different, look different, and act different because of that primary relationship? This book of admonitions that James gives us, these proverbial sayings are intermingled with prescriptions for conduct. And it really lends itself to the Wesleyan focus on holiness of life because of its preoccupation with what we do. It's not what we say, it's what we do. And James, as tradition has it, was the brother of Jesus. And so I like to imagine that this letter is a result of being the brother of Jesus and listening to all that Jesus was saying his whole life, not just during the three years of ministry that we see in the Gospels, 
But his whole life, well, at least James's whole life, since he was the younger brother. Remember that scene in, in, the, three, in the three Gospels where it says Jesus's mother and his brothers came to see him? Well, they really came because they thought he was acting crazy. And, you know, James was leading the pack and telling them that Jesus had gone crazy and they needed to get him help. Take him someplace where he wouldn't be an embarrassment to the whole family. But now in this letter, all of that changed. Maybe James looked in the mirror and didn't like what he saw. So when the resurrected Jesus showed up and said, Hey, I need you, James. James the doer stepped up. When he looked into Jesus' eyes, the eyes he knew from his own birth, the eyes that managed to love him even when he didn't want them to, those eyes seemed to call for more and now seemed to give more. And when he looked into those eyes, it was as if something took root in him. Something was planted. A reason, a purpose, a new beginning, a new soul. And all that he did, he did because of that implanted word, the hope that was revived, the soul that was restored. James was a doer. James was faithful. And I want to focus on a couple of these verses. verses. First verse 19. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak. And slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. And then skipping to verse 26. If you claim to be religious or holy, but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. You know, the Christian community and, and preachers probably especially, place a high regard on the talent of eloquent speech. But in these verses, James places the accent on listening. It is the person who listens intently to the word of truth who progresses in godliness. And whatever is begun in anger ends in shame. Anger is never without a reason but seldom with a good one. Those words came from Ben Franklin. Angry, cynical people die young. The studies show it that men who score high for hostility on standard tests are four times more likely to die prematurely than men whose scores are low. Did you know that when a rattlesnake is cornered, sometimes it becomes so angry that it bites itself? Well, when a person harbors hatred or bitterness in one's heart, one is poisoning him or herself just like the rattlesnake that bites itself. Anger leads to bitterness, resentment, and ultimately isolation. It destroys you and causes us to speak harshly. James expects people who have been given birth in Christ to begin changing our habits and our behavior. He tells us to become slow to speak. We have a problem, though. Listening is most difficult when we are angry. In fact, the underlying anger is a primary and root cause for our slowness to listen and our quickness to speak. It's clear that James perceived a close connection between speaking and anger. I can tell you that I've experienced this most in my family relationships. My most heated words to my family, Jenny and our children, always originated from anger. 
and I said things I should not have said, and I caused further pain and alienation. I did not help the situation. I exacerbated it through various counseling. We learned techniques to try and calm situations down rather than exacerbate them. And I think that's what happens with anger and speech. And we have to learn to calm the situation before we speak. You know, this type of behavior is rampant in our society today. Anger from real or perceived wrongs causes us to speak hatefully and respond irrationally. You can look at talk radio or TV, and you can see it's largely based on incensing, raising, exacerbating these emotions of hate and anger. James says, doers of the word will not participate nor condone such conduct. As Christians, we're called to a different standard. James himself again says, you must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. And if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. So what can we do? Well, first of all, I believe we have to lower the temperature of our emotions and take time to let our anger subside before we do anything. Abraham Lincoln had a practice that when he was angry, he would write a letter to the person whom he was angry at. And after he wrote that letter, he would put it in his desk. And the next day he would come back and he would throw that letter away and write another letter. This time the letter was much more circumspect and much more productive. He lowered the temperature before he responded. I think one of the things we learned from our series, Faith in Action, is when we get angry, one of the things we need to do is count our blessing and not dwell on our perceived offenses. We have so many blessings that God has given us. And if we focus on those blessings rather than our perceived wrongs, our whole attitude changes and we can lower that temperature of anger. Next, never speak in anger. When we speak in anger, no good can come from it. And finally, listen more than we speak. I think conversations today almost always have people talking over each other. And no one truly is listening when the other person is speaking many times. In fact, if you're like me, you're, while they're speaking, you're already in your mind trying to come up with your own counter arguments. I need to learn to listen intently and to try and understand the other's perspective, think about that. And then I can reply in a more informed and more loving manner. Let's put this into practice in our everyday lives. Let's put this into practice in our conversations with one another and let's try and truly be doers of the word. 
not just hearers, but practicing what we have heard. And so, as we leave here, as we go from this time of worship into our ordinary lives, may our conduct truly reflect what James has tried to teach today. That we will be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Will you pray with me? Oh God, you know more than anyone else that these words were probably directed at me today. So Lord, give me the, the grace to put these principles into action in my life. that I will not let anger lead to resentment and bitterness and isolation. But Lord, help us all to turn down the temperature and to reply and respond and to speak in love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So go out, practice, Lowering the temperature, listening a lot more than we speak, and never respond in anger, and let others see the true godliness and holiness of the Jesus Christ that dwells within us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you and have a great week.